We are introducing Ariwa Youth Mentorship Program. The AYMP is a collection of Northern Nigeria academics and professionals from different spheres of life who volunteer to offer free mentorship and equip Northern Nigeria youth at all levels with necessary knowledge on career opportunities, scholarship grants, personality building, innovation, among others. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Tariq Ahmed and uh, as always on behalf of the organizing committee AYMP, um, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all uh, to this timely and pertinent session on skills rather than uh, just degrees. Uh, and as you've seen in the tutorials today, we are honored uh, to have in our midst Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim, the first minister of digital economy of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, um, who will help us understand really why it is uh, crucial to focus not only uh, on academic accomplishments, but on highly sought out fourth industrial revolution skills, uh, such as complex uh, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, and many more. So thank you very much for honoring our invitation, sir. And uh, our agenda, as many of you might already be familiar with, uh, will begin uh, usually by hearing from Dr. Akubu Dill, who will give us a short opening remarks, uh, and then also talk us through how we can get involved with the Aliwave uh, Mentorship Program. Uh, subsequently, we'll hear from our mentor, Professor Rabi Asadi Husaid, uh, who will welcome our special guests and also advise us all uh, on how we can really get the best out of uh, the session today. And then, of course, we'll hear from our special guest, Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim, uh, for about an hour, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A session after his talk. So uh, without taking much of your time, I'll just pass on the virtual mic to Dr. Uh, Yakubu Dill for his opening remarks. So uh, Dr. over to you, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tariq. Uh, let me start by thanking Almighty Allah for making this uh, session possible. Uh, I would also like to send our profound gratitude to our mentor, Professor Issa Ali Pantami, who also is our role model for honoring this uh, invitation. Uh, actually, the first time I told uh, Prof about the need to organize this session, and I requested that he gives us a suitable time, uh, his only response was, we should just set the time and let him know of the time that we choose, you know, because to him, there's really no free time. So this really shows how he prioritizes this uh, concept of mentorship and anything that has to do with the development of uh, and progress of our people. So we are really a uh, grateful pro. And uh, I believe this is just uh, one segment of our interactions and engagement. Uh, with Professor. There are many other areas in which uh, Professor has a lot of uh, experience which we will need to tap from really. So in the future, uh, I hope uh, we will have this uh, similar just and I believe Prof will honor our invitation based on my knowledge of his commitment uh, to the development of our people. So uh, the fact that today I think we have a number of uh, new guests who have not been familiar with uh, what we have been doing, let me briefly talk about uh, what we do at uh, the Ariwa Youth Mentorship uh, Program. So the AYMP actually has been established about uh, three years ago uh, by uh, some youth like uh, colleagues who are, happens, from, happens to be from academia, from the industry, uh, entrepreneurs who just uh, see the need to come together and uh, offer our contribution to uh, our youth. So, so far this is our 31st uh, webinar we organized, so roughly we, uh, we organized a webinar in a month. This is our 31st uh, session in three years. And apart from organizing uh, webinars, uh, generally what we do, we share opportunities uh, to our people uh, regarding jobs and scholarships and uh, entrepreneurial guidance. We do that through our social media platforms. 
uh, particularly the Telegram page. So I believe many people will want to join after this session. So I will share the, the handle uh, in the chat box so that uh, people can be able to, to join. And our past sessions also can be accessed uh, from our YouTube page in case if you have not been able to join before. Uh, this uh, session also will be uploaded immediately to the Ariwa Mentorship uh, YouTube page, so it can always serve as a reference uh, in the future. So, uh, I would also uh, like to acknowledge the effort of the people that have been contributing to the course of this program. Uh, Prof, there are many uh, people who have volunteered to serve as uh, mentors. They share opportunities. They contribute in organizing these programs. So I would really like to appreciate them, and particularly our mother, Professor Rabia Said, who also happens to be our mentor from Physics Department of Bayer University, Kano. So she guides us also, and she advises us on how to move this program forward. So without taking much of time, uh, Dr. Tarek, I think we can commence the, the program. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, yes, you did. Uh, you mentioned this quite right, um, uh, Prof. Despite his, you know, busy schedules, um, did give us some time really to um, talk to us. You know, just recently, as you know, you know, he's uh, published a book, which uh, is the title of our talk today. Um, that book is quite a lot of interesting information quite there, so it's highly recommended. You haven't grabbed a copy yet, you do so. Um, but before then, probably, I think uh, the best thing for me to do now is to call on uh, Professor to um, welcome Professor. So we've got, as you've mentioned, Professor Rabia Sadio Said, who's uh, our mentor, uh, to welcome our special guest today. And also, as I've mentioned earlier, to uh, give us a brief of advice of how we can really benefit from today's session. So Professor, uh, thank you very much uh, also for uh, the mentorship. Okay. Uh, hello. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you for the mention. And um, I want to like briefly say that I am re reintroduce myself. Mm -hmm. I'm Professor Rabia Salim Said. Uh, at, of the physics department, a professor of physics at Bayro University, Kano. So aside from my day job, um, I'm a mentor of boys and girls, men and women. And one of uh, the greatest passion that I have is uh, advocacy for young men and women to, uh, particularly those from Northern Nigeria, to take place, their place in leadership positions and the, in the service to humanity. Therefore, please permit me to welcome our esteemed and revered guest, mm -hmm. Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim, popularly known as Sheikh Pantemi, uh, we, where we all re, uh, revere him and appreciate all that he does uh, for the society, and um, particularly for Islam. It is my privilege and honor to welcome him to this session and to thank him for accepting our invitation. Uh, I would like to inform our prof and Sheikh that AYMP, starting from a humble beginning with the foresight of my students and mentees, uh, and that, that or, and particularly um, uh, the, the foremost among them, uh, Dr. Yakubu Sani Mudil, who I'm very mighty proud of, um, for being his uh, lecturer and also for him having this foresight together with others who have gathered uh, with him. Uh, this organization, as it was conceived, has actually grown in leaps and bounds, and it is touching lives, uh, a lot of testimonies we have had. Uh, a lot has been set in motion, and we have registered our presence in the virtual space, and therefore also planning to register the presence in the physical uh, space by establishing a physical office with a space for one-on-one -on -one mentoring and a dream of a library, both physical and virtual, uh, and, and, and probably virtual in this case, digital, 
and uh, which I know that uh, our prof is, uh, is uh, very familiar with, uh, uh, that mentees can consult for resources on skills and degrees, because I believe that we can have, we can have both. I would like to inform our dear Sheikh that we'll soon come soliciting his help to make this dream a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, our participants today, like I always say, keep a notebook, make sure that you put down all that you are going to learn today, because I know you will learn a lot, which will be very useful for you. I therefore present to you our revered Sheikh, our professor, Isa Ali Ibrahim, and welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yes, I always I do have, uh, you know, based on your suggestion, I have got my paper and uh, my pen just to take notes of uh, all the interesting um, uh, talk that we'll uh, hear today. So thank you very much, Prof. Um, right. Really, while I was preparing um, this, uh, you know, moderation, I thought about where's the best place to start, and I felt um, probably by citing. Uh, this famous book, uh, rather than just degrees, where Prof uh, highlighted that many people find it difficult to get a job they seek even after years of studies. And at the same time, you've got um, all these employers that have you know, all these job openings as well that they want to fill in, but then most of the applicants that do put in those applications don't have the required skills um, in order to fill those uh, jobs. So clearly, as is mentioned, uh, there's a clear mismatch between what employers are looking for and what potential employees have to offer. So really, there's quite a number of questions. Um, how do we bridge, first of all, this gap between uh, what I've just mentioned, you know, the skills that are needed and what potential employees uh, employers do have uh, or other employees do have and what sort of strategies do we need in order to follow, in order to uh, bridge this uh, gap that we've just mentioned? What have other organizations, what have other countries uh, about corporate social responsibility? How does it fit into the puzzle? You know, what has to his humbleness, but I'm sure uh, we'll hear about some of the strategies uh, that they've uh, developed. Um, so I think uh, at this juncture, I would uh, like to welcome once again Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim. Uh, but before then, I think maybe a short um, introduction. Again, I think, you know, talking through the achievements of Prof, it's a lecture on its own. So, I've, you know, I, I do apologize for cutting your CV short, Prof. Um, uh, I've got uh, a few pages uh, which, which I've got down. So, uh, Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim was born in Pantani of Kumbi State in Nigeria. Uh, and he was the Minister of Communication and the first ever Minister of Digital Economy of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, a position that he held from 2019 to 2023. Uh, he obtained a five-year Bachelor of Technology degree in Computer Science from uh, Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa University in uh, uh, Bauchi, and then proceeded to acquire two master's degrees, uh, an MSc in Computer Science and an MBA in Technology management from the same institution in quick succession. Uh, he then went on to Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, uh, where he obtained a one-year postgraduate certificate in research methods and then a PhD uh, in computer information uh, systems. Professor Ibrahim teaches cyber security and information security and also supervises postgraduate research students and partake in community service as the first professor of cyber security in the Federal University of Technology uh, in Imo State and he took the appointment since March 2021, and he is also the first professor of cybersecurity from the northern part of the country. He has the distinction of being the first and only African so far, uh, so far to be certified as a fellow of the UK Chartered Institute of Information Security amongst 18 and other fellows. He was also appointed by the International Telecommunications Union uh, as the chairman of the World Summit of the uh, information Security 2022 and his tenure did mark an outstanding transformation of the program as it was attested by the Secretary General and other top ranking officials of the United Nations. Now, prior to his appointment as a minister, he was the um, uh, Chief Information Technology Officer of Nigeria uh, and the Director General, the Chief Executive Officer 
uh, of, the Inter of the National Information Technology Development Agency, which is NITGA, uh, which has a strong mandate on research, regulation, and development of information technology. As the Nigeria's inaugural Minister of Digital Economy, Professor Ibrahim Stenia was marked by remarkable achievements. He introduced a national digital economy policy and strategy and the national broadband plan, among other initiatives. And uh, within just about three years, he crafted over 23 national policies leading to pivotal development, like the first national uh, center for artificial intelligence and robotics in 2021. The strategies such as the revised national Name SIM registration policy that blocked over 2.4 million unregistered SIM cards and enrolled 100 million citizens on the national identity database significantly boosted cybersecurity. With his guidance, the communications and digital economy sector saw an unmatched influx of new policies and over 4,300 successful projects under parastatal agencies, which he supervised. His exceptional achievement and performance. Uh, was applauded internationally with distinctions in all the ministerial uh, uh, ministerial deliverables, a testament to his dedication and brilliance. Um, once again, as I've mentioned, uh, I do apologize for cutting your CV short, uh, sir. But in terms of certifications, Professor uh, did hold several certifications from prestigious institutions, such as Certificate in Digital Transformation from Harvard University, uh, digital strategy from both MIT and Institute of Management Development, design in Switzerland, strategic leadership from Oxford University, bespoke session on lawmaking at Sussex Law, uh, and the University of Cambridge certification in management, among others. Furthermore, um, Professor is a recipient of several awards, both nationally and internationally. He was conferred with the prestigious commander of the Order of Niger in May uh, of 2023, and uh, he's also the Chief Digital Officer of the Federation. He's a well sought after speaker delivering convocations, graduations, lectures, and several public and private universities, in several uh, public as well as private universities. Um, Professor Ibrahim has been the, chair, uh, the champion of the MIT uh, REAP program, so the Abuja uh, REAP program from 2019 to 2021. And he has published several academic articles in professional journals presented papers in more than 190 conferences and published several books, among which include several, I mean, the skills rather than just degrees, the edification of society to foster an internet economy, building a digital economy, and many more. Um, Professor is also popularly known as the Digital Minister. He is a global IT citizen, a chartered computer scientist, a chartered cybersecurity expert, and also a fellow of several institutions as well as societies. He is happily married uh, with children. So thank you very much once again for honoring our uh, invitation, sir. I'll, I'll give you the floor now. <laughs> thank you very much. The coordinator of uh, the Arewa Youth Mentorship Program, Dr. Yakubu Osani Udil, and uh, also the moderator who has overblown my trumpet, Dr. Tariq Ahmed Galadensi, our elder sister here with us, professor from a, a bio-university, Kano, other academics, industry players, policy makers, youth entrepreneurs. Good afternoon to all of you. And uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May Allah's peace, mercy, and blessings be upon you. Uh, firstly, permit me to begin by commending the effort of uh, Arewa Youth Mentorship Program or Forum for inviting me to join you here virtually and also discuss even superficially the book I have uh, recently authored entitled Skills Rather Than Just Degrees. Furthermore, I once again use the opportunity to commend 
this uh, very important initiative on the, of Arewa Youth Mentorship Program, uh, particularly if there is one thing that is missing in Nigeria, particularly in Northern Nigeria, that has created a huge gap between successful citizens and others is lack of mentorship. There is a huge gap today between citizens that are so far successful in life and those that are struggling to be successful. That gap can easily be bridged by a mentorship program where we invite our youth, we discuss with them, we allow them to ask questions, to criticize constructively, and also we guide them through the process. It is because of this, I personally commend this initiative. And I'm very proud to be part and parcel of it. In addition, I'm not here to make any presentation, but rather I'm only here to present the book, why the book was authored, and also to go superficially through the content and uh, maybe point out some important areas that I think are very relevant to us here. And in the end, I would appreciate if an ample time is given to the, those who joined us online. I can see here, even the house is full. And just before starting, I discovered even online through a page bearing my name with over 1.1,300, uh, 1, more than 1,300 followers among many other platforms. So I'm more interested in making this program to be like an engagement because there could be questions, there could be misconceptions, there could be guidance needed so that uh, through answering questions, I will be able to address all these issues. Prior to that, I begin by presenting the book to all of you here, which is skills rather than just degrees. And I know it is available on Amazon and other e-commerce platforms if you are willing to buy. This book was uh, unveiled and launched on the 24th November, 2022, uh, the, the Transcorp Hilton here, Abuja. During the unveiling of the book, the Executive Secretary of National Universities Commission was there. Executive Secretary of uh, National uh, Technical Board was also there. The Executive Secretary of uh, NCCE was there in charge of our uh, colleges of uh, education and in attendance around 22 university vice chancellors attended the event. In addition to other academics and uh, government officials, the, the vice chancellor of ABU, I believe, was there. BUK was there. That of Amfordia University was there. Geshua Federal University of uh, University was also there. From the south, I believe, the vice chancellor of University of Lagos was uh, there. That of Port Harcourt was there. That of University of Ibadan was also there, among many other vice chancellors. Around 22 vice chancellors uh, attended the event, some even from uh, private universities. So. Uh, actually, I'm only here to present my own advocacy, what I call paradigm shift. It is all about challenging us to make a shift from where we are to another position. As our elder sister, uh, our professor of physics earlier mentioned, uh, even the book, emphasizes more on combining the two. The book is not in any way condemning certificates, but rather the book is agitating that acquiring an empty certificate today is not enough. Even if certificate becomes your own path of getting a job, that empty certificate will not in any way make it possible for you to do the job. Your career progression requires many skills. So our focus is to ensure that our certificates are not empty. 
That is what the book advocates to ensure that certificates are not empty. And secondly, they are not only theoretical. And thirdly, to convince ourselves that certificates may expire today. They may not expire officially and formally, but if you acquire a certificate without developing your skills, after a period of time, most probably the knowledge you acquired in the university could not be the up-to-date knowledge when it comes to doing your job or what employers are looking for. So by implication, again, even if you acquire a certificate, that should not be the end of your studies. But the way our environment are changes, the way job requirements are changing, you should ensure that even after the certificate, you continue to build on that and acquire many more skills, whether it is hard skills, or soft skills, or even social skills. As uh, mentioned by the moderator, Dr. Thadi Ahmed, I also attended many institutions. And uh, with all sense of humility, I acquired certificates from degree to MSc to MBA to PhD. And I was blessed to also attend most of the most recognized universities globally. I was in Harvard University, University of Oxford, Cambridge University, MIT and uh, IMD. And I even served as the champion of uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology for two years. This is also another academic industry and government position where we brought together government institutions, academia, and industry to work on certain projects. So actually, the, what the book advocates is actually firstly to ensure that our degrees are not empty. Secondly, during our learning, we should not unnecessarily restrict ourselves to what is being taught in our classes while in university or any higher institutions of learning. Thirdly, after graduation, that should not be the end of acquiring knowledge, but we continue to partake in training and retraining, particularly in obtaining certifications, because certifications, uh, obtaining certifications is one of the easiest ways to lead you to more hard skills, soft skills, among others. The book, as I earlier mentioned, was uh, unveiled and launched on the 24th November, 2022, with 137 pages. Prior to launching of the book, I shared the draft with so many academics, industry players, and even policy makers, because the book is all about bridging the gap between academia, industry, and also government. So I share the draft. Some of the people that review the draft, firstly in industry, the president of uh, the Microsoft, Brad Smith in the US, and who is also an attorney in the US, read the draft and even wrote the foreword of the book. He's one of the leading players in industry today globally. If you look at the way Bill Gates commends him whenever he speaks about him, you will agree with me that he's among the people that are respected globally in the industry. He commended the idea and he sent a personal message to me when he read the book. He said that, I am glad that you have written this book. And he said that I have learned a lot while reading your own draft. He sent a personal message to me. He said that he is highly excited that uh, the book has enriched his knowledge when it comes to the skills that are required in the fourth industrial revolution. Furthermore, in Nigeria, some academics also review the book, like the vice chancellor of uh, Bayero University, Kano Professor Abbas Adamurashid. He reviewed the book and also he sent his review, which has also been published as part of the book. He commended the initiative and he also bought the idea. The vice chancellor of uh, University of Port Harcourt, Professor Ounari Abraham Jochwin, 
reviewed the book also and he wrote his own review, which has also been published along with the book is inside. And thirdly, the vice chancellor of my alma mater, Ahmed, uh, Abu Bakr Tapao Balewa University, Professor Abdel Adis also reviewed the book and he sent his review and that has also been published along with the book. Furthermore, when it comes to formulating even the title of the book, Skills Rather Than Just Degrees, all of them reviewed it and they endorsed the topic. It is in alignment with the content. And the title of the topic also, I personally shared with other academics, like our brother, Professor Salis Shehu, the Vice Chancellor of Istikama University. He endorsed the title of the book. And also I shared it with Professor Adeyolo Akande, who is another professor also from uh, Oyo State. He reviewed the title of the book he endorsed. All of them endorsed it. So this is only to show that uh, the book has not only been published by the author, but I brought together people from academia, industry, and policy makers. When it comes to policy makers, I shared it also with uh, uh, His Excellency Babatunde Rajifashola, the former governor of uh, Lagos State, a senior advocate of Nigeria, among others. All of them reviewed it from government and also endorsed the content. So this is just in summary to show to us that the concept is not only of the auto, but rather the auto shared even the draft with other experts in government, academia, and industry in order to ensure that we are on the same page when it comes to that advocacy. Particularly, the book agitates for the implementation of a, a customized triple helix model. Triple helix model is all about bringing, bridging the gap and also promoting constant interaction between academia, industry, and government, most importantly, between academia and industry. So it is because of this that I ensure that all our stakeholders in academia, in government, in industry, at least uh, uh, have been represented in the crafting the concept and also in promoting the concept. In addition, in the book, there are seven chapters. There is no time for me to speak on a larger scale, but I will only go briefly and outline certain things. And I do hope that an ample time, enough time is going to be given to the participants in order to at least comment on it, ask questions and, uh, con and criticize constructively because I'm here for it. If you have any disagreement, then you can come out and criticize uh, before the author and allow him to, to defend himself. So it is an intellectual and academic discussion. Don't feel like maybe the author is your teacher or you respect him uh, either academically, religiously, and otherwise. No, you are free to come. And if you know anybody also who doesn't share the same paradigm shift, before the end of the event, you may wish to invite him. Let him please join us to discuss what the book is all about and let him come out and comment positively or negatively about the paradigm shift we are promoting. Furthermore, some of the major reasons that this book advocates is to shift and ensure that our institutions partake in this paradigm shift of producing potential employees to producing potential employers. Secondly, to ensure that the certificates we give to students, diploma, NCE, BSc, BTEC, B engineering, MSc, MBA, PhD are not empty. Thirdly, to also ensure that we prioritize skills while in university rather than theories. Fourthly, to also support in economic development 
and address the challenge of unemployment on one hand and unemployability on the other. Because sometimes in Nigeria, when we discuss the challenge of unemployment, we intentionally ignore the issue of unemployability. A situation where a student graduates, but he doesn't have the skills to be employed immediately to start the work. So there is a challenge of unemployment in Nigeria, in Africa, in many underdeveloped countries, and even the developed countries, but the challenge of unemployability is the most serious one. Why? Because some people have gone through the training, they obtained the certificates, but when they are employed, they will not be able to do the work. So this is the problem of unemployability. We have unemployed youth, there is no doubt about this. However, we must agree that we have unemployable youth as well. They will not be, they are unemployable. You cannot address the challenge of unemployability without addressing the challenge that exists between academia and industry. And secondly, without making sure that graduates do acquire the skills that are required, particularly in the fourth industrial revolution. I will cite some two examples as I discussed in the book. Firstly, an example of Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the US. I serve as the champion of MIT. One of the concepts they have been promoting is prioritizing skills, particularly innovation and entrepreneurship. In 2016, there was a research conducted which has been entitled as MIT Nation. In that research, it was clearly mentioned that if MIT were to be a country, if MIT were to be a country, as at in 2016, MIT could be the 10th largest economy globally ahead of India. India with a population of 1.3 billion people then. Today, India is the number one in terms of population globally ahead of China. So the collective gross domestic product of our MIT graduates, the serial entrepreneurs of MIT at that time was around 2 trillion USD. More than five times the GDP of Nigeria as a country then with 200 million people. Why? Because of the concept of uh, providing skills to their students. So the book is not in any way discouraging you from obtaining certificates, but rather we are agitating and advocating for adopting a model like that of MIT in the US, where our graduates, our students are going to be provided with skills since from their first year to their graduation, so that when they graduate, they will not have the problem of uh, unemployability. Another example, and my participation and being the champion of MIT to promote skills development, that is what motivated me in 2020 to come up with the concept of having Nigeria Startup Act. Today we have Nigeria Startup Act 2022, which was signed by the then President, President Muhammad Buhari on the 19th of October, 2022. That if you look at it in our area of ICT, it is all about providing the supports that are needed for our citizens to acquire skills. And this is the same concept that has been used in places like uh, Silicon Valley. After the draft, MIT sent a letter to me. We had an engagement with the university where they indicated their willingness to learn from our initiative in Nigeria. Furthermore, another example is the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, that is IIT. There are many campuses of uh, IIT in India, whether in Delhi, in Shenzhen, and uh, Mumbai. So they had many campuses. The university was established in 1950. The concept of the university 
is to provide skills for their citizens. And if you look at even the percentage of uh, accepting students, you will, is mind boggling. The percentage of uh, getting admitted into the university is only is around 2%, even more difficult than that of Harvard University. Today, if you look at the concept of IIT in India, you will discover because of the way and manner they promote skills. Many tech giants, many companies, global companies in the world, go to IIT India a year or two before students graduate. They even ask them to come and work for them. Most of them graduate while they are on employment is waiting for them, even before graduation, some two years to their graduation. And secondly, the concept they promote in IIT is to also ensure that uh, students do not focus only on becoming employer, uh, employees, but rather they focus more on becoming employees after graduation. Because of uh, that concept being promoted by IIT in India, you will discover each graduate of IIT is averagely an employer of 100 people globally. Each graduate is not just an employee, but is an employer. And if you take the 30 major tech companies globally, you will discover that 28 out of 30 graduated from IIT or an institution that is an affiliate of IIT. 28 out of 30. Take for instance, the CEO of Google came from IIT India. CEO of Microsoft from IIT India. CEO of Adobe came from IIT India. Many CEOs globally, 28 out of 30 came from that institution. Why? because they ensure their students do obtain the skills that are required. Another concept of IIT is when you are enrolled as a student, from your first year, you will be challenged to come up with your startup, just like your company. You will go and register your company, your concept. Throughout your period of studying, you will be guided on how this startup will become successful. By the end, when you graduate from your university, automatically your company graduates along with you. So with any employment or not, you are automatically an employer after your graduation. That is why most of their graduates, immediately they graduate, you will discover they start employing others. And that is why you will discover that the economy of India is growing by the day. As at early this year, according to the International Monetary Fund, India was the fifth largest economy. Number one, the US, number two, China. Number three, it was uh, Germany, but now Japan. Number four, Germany, number five, India. And India was number six before. But now India is ahead of the United Kingdom. This is to show to us how this concept is yielding a positive result in other countries. And it is very important that we ensure that students do acquire skills. And even if you are university or you are polytechnic or college of education fails to give you the skills, this is not a reason why you should just sit down there are 1,001 ways where you can obtain skills today. Instead of wasting your time sometimes on the Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or WhatsApp, there are so many beneficial programs being conducted by Harvard or MIT or Cambridge or Oxford online. You can follow them. There are many certifications for free. You can follow them. It is not necessary that whatever is required your institution must provide, but you have to ensure that you build your skills. And this is indeed very important. Furthermore, the issue of we can safely categorize skills into two 
or into three. Firstly, hard skills. Hard skills are usually being taught in our schools. However, we usually prioritize the theoretical aspect over and above the technical aspect of it. Hard skills are also called technical skills, meaning the technical skills or the technical knowledge you acquire, sometimes through hands-on training, like programming, how you write a program, or mathematical skills, how to solve certain problems, or uh, skills in physics, where you, you try to, 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 to solve certain problems in physics, or blockchain technology as part of the fourth industrial revolution or artificial intelligence or robotics, cloud computing, among many others. They are called hard skills. So usually our syllabus focuses more on hard skills and even the hard skills, mostly they are theoretical. We, even if your institutions has not provided the hard skills that are required, except the theoretical aspects significantly, you have to create time out of no time to ensure that you acquire these technical skills, particularly in your area of our study, whether you are in computer science or physics, or you are in electrical engineering or any engineering, whether you are in social sciences, in economics, accounting, or any field, you will discover that there could be certain skills that require you to learn hands-on, whether it is an application or a system or problem solving among others. As a student or as a young person, your institution may not be able to provide whatever is required, but I strongly advise you even if that is not provided by your institution, you have to come up with your plan to ensure that when you graduate, you will be able to defend the certificate you have obtained. Let us remember that the priority of attending an institution is not just the unit certificate, but rather the knowledge, the education you acquire through the years you spent, not only the certificate, because this misconception must be corrected. Only last year, I don't want to mention the university and the personality, but we have all read. A graduate of a university went to that university with a certificate that since his graduation, he couldn't find any job. So let the university refund his school fees and he, is willing, he was willing to give them the certificate. So look at our wrong perception. University is not only to give you a certificate, but to ensure you go through a training. That certificate is just to, to validate the training you have attained in that institution. The education you have obtained, but it's not the target. The target is the knowledge. The certificate is only to validate. It's just like an evidence that you have attended that institution, but it's not the priority. The priority is what you have been taught in school. That is the priority. And that is why if you go on the certificate, it is clearly written that the certificate is awarded to you in learning, in character and learning. Look at it, in character and learning. So the student did not return or the graduate did not return the training or education he acquired from the university, but he returned the certificate. So this is a misconception that we must address. And today, most of our youth forget about the importance of that training they are going through. They only focus on the certificates. If a teacher comes into their class or a lecturer comes into their class and say, you, there are two alternatives. You either attend the course and at the end of the semester, any grade you get, I will award it to you. Or you leave the class throughout the semester without attending any classes, without writing any test or exam. And at the end of it, I will give you B as you are great. Many students will decide not to attend the class and at the end of the semester, they would be given B great. That is better for them. Why? Because we prioritize grades and certificates over and above the training 
education and knowledge being provided to us while in schools. So the certificate is not the priority. Certificate is only to validate what we have been taught. If you buy a car today, there is a receipt. Receipt only is not what you buy, but it's just an indication that you have purchased this car. If you go to a hospital, you pay certain amount of money for a medical treatment, usually there could be a receipt. Either that one to be given to you in hard copy or in soft copy. In any situation, you are not paying for the receipt, but for the services to be provided for you. The same in a hotel. So the paper given to you is an evidence that you have attended these institutions and you have gone through this training. We should avoid prioritizing it and focus more on the training. And to show to us that many developed countries are adopting this paradigm shift. In June 2020, the then president of the US, President Donald Trump, signed an executive order directing the largest employer of labor in the US to prioritize skills in the process of employment over and above paper certificates. Why? Because skills can do the work. Paper certificate without skills cannot do the work. And the aim is to ensure that the work is done. So in the US today, they have an executive order that was signed in June 2022 prioritizing skills over an empty paper certificate. And this has been adopted in many tech giants globally. There are many tech companies that if you go, they will not ask you for any university you have attended or any polytechnic. They are after your skills. What can you do? If it did hard skills, what did you develop? Secondly, we have soft skills. Soft skills are largely missing in our curriculum. They are largely. However, the recent effort of Professor Abubakar Adamurashid before his resignation, it was uh, commendable because it, it was an effort to bring social skills, uh, soft skills into our curriculum. When they developed it, he shared it with me officially for me to review and advise them. And I look into the new curriculum. I work on it for almost 40 days and I submitted all my observations in writing and the amendments to be included. And he accommodated all of them and he appreciated our humble effort. Prior to that, soft skills, you will discover are completely missing in our curriculum. Soft skills, there are many of them, but the World Economic Forum, WEF, conducted a research in 2015 and also repeated the same research in 2020. That of 2020 is the most recent. The research they conduct usually after five, five years or thereabout is to look at the job opportunities in the world the skill priority in the world that you must obtain before you compete globally. They recommended many skills, but I want to emphasize more on the skills <clears throat> that have been consistent since 2015 to date. They are very relevant. If you want to apply for any job, if you want to solve any problem, if you want to be successful in life today as an entrepreneur or as an employee, or as an employer, or as an entrepreneur, you must acquire these skills. Otherwise, sooner or later, your initiative will expire. I will mention superficially at least seven to eight of them that have been consistent. Number one is critical thinking. Critical thinking is important, that we must allow our students, our youth, to be creating time every day to partake in critical thinking. Critical thinking has around five steps. For example, there is observation, analyzing, inference, and complex problem solving. These are some of the, these are the stages of our critical thinking. Critical thinking 
brought about most of the global solutions we are enjoying today. Critical thinking brought about Uber. Just to sit down and think critically, identify a problem and come up with a solution. Critical thinking brought about Facebook or Metaverse or Meta. Critical thinking brought about artificial intelligence solutions we are using today, chat GPT, OGP, among others, through critical thinking. So today, if critical thinking is adopted in our institutions, or we adopt them at personal level, an undergraduate problem, an undergraduate thesis or project in a university should not be just for a prerequisite for graduation. It should solve a minimum of one problem being encountered by at least one million people globally. One problem. So solutions through critical thinking, our undergraduate projects are going to address the challenges we are being confronted with today, either economic challenges, security challenges, among others. Without critical thinking, we cannot go anywhere. The way our youth spend time dancing on Instagram or TikTok, how do you anticipate these people to, co to partake in critical thinking? Take for instance, Gmail, the entire Gmail of Google came about because of critical thinking. Google has a policy, what they call 20% policy. Within their working hours every day, staff and employees are given 20 minutes, 20% uh, of their office hours to isolate themselves and partake in critical thinking. That is what happened. One of their staff identified a challenge of internal communication. He came up with Gmail account. That Gmail account was internally adopted by Google. And at the end of it, it becomes a global account. Today, it is one of the best global accounts you can have when it comes to your electronic mails. It's true critical thinking, 20% policy. You have 20% of your time to partake in critical thinking. It is important that in our institutions, we encourage our youth to partake in critical thinking, identify some problems, come up with their solutions. Their time should not be restricted only to garbage in, garbage out. It shouldn't be like that. Only to memorize maybe your uh, class lectures and pass an examination. No, we have to challenge them to use their intellect to partake in critical thinking and come up with some solutions to complex problems we have been encountered with. And this is indeed very important. So critical thinking is key. There is no success today without critical thinking. Number two, complex problem solving. After partaking in critical thinking, you have to identify complex problem and make an attempt to solve it. Complex problem. This is indeed very important as well. It's true complex problem solving. Today we have Amazon. Jeffrey Bezos came up with the idea of Amazon around 1994. Up to 2003, nine to 10 years without making a profit of $1. But he was very consistent and steadfast. By 2017, he became the richest person in the world. He doesn't have any shop where you go and purchase. He only establishes a platform and maintains it where potential buyers on one hand and potential sellers on the other interact. And through their interaction and transaction, he gets something out of it. And through that process, he became the richest person in the world. Why? Because of critical thinking and complex problem solving. And this is why mentorship is important. Number three, creativity. You can say creativity, or you can say creative thinking, or you can say thinking out of the box. Thinking out of the box 
People are solving this problem through following this route day in, day out. You have to challenge yourself and find another solution to the problem that could save cost, time, and more efficiency and effectiveness. So this is what creativity is all about, thinking out of the box. When I was appointed in a public office, I inherited nine challenges in our sector where all people believe that these problems had no solution. When I came on board through creative thinking, all these problems were solved within the first one year, all of them. So try to delete the word impossible in your dictionary. Try to delete it, try to be optimistic. It's important. If you are not optimistic, you could be wise. Any problem is this is impossible, impossible. People that are saying impossible, they could be wise in saving their energy, but they will never provide a solution to the world. So try to be optimistic. Any problem must have a solution. Don't agree that this is not possible. No, we must try another solution. Try to come up with the possible solutions to it. That is why thinking out of the box is critical. There is no problem that has only one solution. If this solution is not applicable, try to find another solution to that problem. Ignoring the problem will never be a solution, but finding a solution to it is necessary. So creative thinking or creativity or thinking out of the box is important. And this is what they promote in MIT and in IIT, the two institutions I earlier cited. You will discover that any problem, you will be challenged to think out of the box and provide a solution to it. Number four is coordinating with others. Coordinating, to learn how to coordinate. And this is in also very important, to know how to coordinate with others. While working at higher level, at lower level. Why? Because there is what is called collaborative thinking. Collaborative thinking is not just about you to think a lot. No, there are some problems that require two, three, four, or more people to interact, work together, and find a solution to it. That is why coordination today is a very important soft skill. Because soft skills are not technical, they are more of a behavioral and interpersonal habits you display. You are behavioral habits and you are interpersonal habits. They're very important. So coordinating with others is also very important. Many systems fail due to lack of coordination. Coordination with others is also brings about your connection. Sometimes people fail to realize even the connection you have with other people that you think they can intervene and help you at certain times is part of soft skills. The connection you have with people that, okay, you are trying to solve this problem and you need someone's intervention, either technically, physically, logically, or any form, that connection is a skill. That is why IBM conducted a research. They say career management success has three ingredients. They say number one is your performance. Number two, your image. Number three is exposure. Exposure is coordination. And they say exposure carries 60% of your success. So coordinating with others, how to interact, the quality of your network, that when there is a challenge, the people you can reach out to, to intervene in their area, that is what we call connection in Nigerian language. It's a skill. And it's part of your coordinating with others. These others could be your mate, could be superior, could be your subordinates, and they could be anywhere. So coordinating with others is also very important. Take for instance, Coordinating with others, salvage Mark Zuckerberg. When he was a university student, he came up with the idea of uh, Facebook. And he got the idea of Facebook from a Nigerian, as he personally admitted. Mark Zuckerberg got the idea from a Nigerian. <laughs> he personally admitted. 
So when he got that idea on how to come up with that solution to a problem, he got the idea from a Nigerian living in the United States of America. He was challenged, he was requested to sell his own startup. At that time, around 100 million USD, which is a huge amount of money today, in particularly in our local currency, 100 million USD. So he was tempted, but he reached out to Steve Jobs, one of his mentors. He said, I was confronted with this amount of money as a student, I need the money. Please advise me whether at least to sell or not. Then he said, I will not advise you, but I will give you three words. He said, travel, disconnect, and reflect. So he traveled to Asia around India. He disconnected from people and he reflected. He decided not to sell. After a few years, he became the fourth richest person in the world. So this is mentorship, and this is also coordinating with others. When you are confronted with a problem, other people are there to help you, to guide you. They were there before you. They solved the problem. By mentoring you, they will provide a solution to you that will save your time, your energy, and will also minimize your mistakes, among others. So coordinating with others. Number five also is project management. How to manage a problem, a, 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 a project. That project could be formal project, could be informal project. How you manage your problem project is another very important soft skills. Any project you embark on, your studies is a project. Your business activities is another project. Your career is your project. Building your house is your project. Getting married is another important project. So there are formal projects and there are informal projects. So the way you manage your project is an important soft skill that is very important towards you being successful in life. Number six also, judgment and decision making. Making a decision, taking a decision is a very important soft skills. You are judgment and the way you take a decision. And that is why emotional intelligence is also important because if care is not taken, and if you do not have an excellent emotional intelligence mechanism, you will be misled in your judgment or in your decision making. So that is why you are on IA is, is, is very important. If you are emotional intelligence, your EQ is very important. So these are some of the soft skills that are important. I only mention them superficially. If you go through the book, you will find many explanations and you will find also more and more elaboration on that. As a student, today, if you look at even the concept being promoted in developed countries like Switzerland, they have one of the best system of education. Finland, they have one of the best system of education among others. You will discover that they promote this concept of hard skills and soft skills. That is what they call dual education. Today, at primary level, in developed countries, children are being taught soft skills, critical thinking, complex problem solving, thinking out of the box, project management, judgment and decision making, among others. They are being taught. So it is because of this that we advocate that our youth today in Nigeria, in Africa, in other developing countries, there is need for us to ensure a maximum utilization of our intellect. Not only to become consumers, we only get lecture not garbage in, garbage out during examination. At the end of it, you get A or B, that is not sufficient. You are to be a problem solver. You are to be a job employer, not only a job employee. 
you are not in any way being requested to follow solutions provided by others only. Sometimes you follow a solution that has been provided by others on one hand. On the other, you try to provide solutions that others will emulate or adopt from you. These things are very important. Number three, which is somehow part of soft skills. However, in the book I have mentioned with another title, that is social skills. Social skills are also important. Social skills are the skills that we use every day in our interaction and communicating, communicating with others. They are called social skills. We interact, we communicate with others. They are very important because first impression lasts long. When you interact with people, ensure that you leave a good impression in their hearts about your personality. Through your generosity, your kindness, through your humility, through your respect for others, you treat them as human beings, not because of the position they occupy, but naturally as a human being, you must respect other human beings. So part of social skills, Make it your habit, you smile to people. You have nothing to lose. I come across you, I smile, I greet you. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Can I help you? There is nothing to lose. It gives you more peace of mind at personal level. Secondly, you should learn how to use certain words like thank you. Anyone that is kind to you, he helps you, thank you. You are lecturer, you are, you are, you are student, you are friend, you are neighbor, you don't know him, but he helps you. Thank you. Using the word please. Can I help you, please? Please is very important. Sometimes using some signs of respect, using sa, ma, yalla boy, rankerede, Allah shigafar tamalam. These are part of what they call social skills. Today, our youth, because of lack of mentorship, particularly in Northern Nigeria, even social skills are missing. A graduate will be employed. He doesn't even know how to respect others. He doesn't even know how to appreciate. Part of social skills, holding doors or holding doors for others. When you enter into a place, somebody is behind you, all they do for him is part of social skills. Just a bit behind you, hold it for him. Part of social skills, we give more and we anticipate less. Whenever you are kind to someone, don't be kind in anticipation of him to be kind to you in the same way and man. We are kind to others because kindness is good. Whether they are kind to us or not is part of social skills. Learn to forgive and forget is part of social skills. You listen more and say less is part of social skills. You listen more and you talk less. Part of social skills, you listen with the intention of learning, not the intention of finding faults to criticize. You always listen with the intention of uh, your willingness to learn from others. There is no monopoly of wisdom and knowledge. You have to indicate that you are willing to learn from others. They are all part of our uh, social skills. So today, when it comes to employment, it is not just about the certificate I obtain or the class of degree I have. These skills are very important. Certificate could give you an opportunity of employment, but definitely an empty certificate cannot take you to greater heights. You need skills to develop. You need skills for your career progression. And these skills are changing, particularly for those of us who graduated over two decades today, for example, you cannot anticipate that the skills you obtain then are relevant today, they are not. Not all of them are relevant. Some could be relevant. Even hard skills, not to talk of soft skills, even hard skills, some of them are not relevant today. 
At that time in university, you, you were being taught basic programming language only, Fortran, only Pascal, sometimes MATLAB, COBOL, and others. Today, even the software engineering is being consumed by artificial intelligence itself. It is being consumed today. So because of this, if you want to be successful in your career, you have to build the skills of uh, making sure that your learning is constant. You are trying to update yourself with the challenges, with the skills that are required globally. And this thing is very important. Let us not undermine skills. They are being required today. If you apply for jobs, even internationally, it's not just about the certificate. Many institutions today do not even ask you your class of degree, even though it is important to you in some places, there is no doubt. And if you say your priority is only the certificate, not the training being provided by your institutions, are, are you aware that there are countries today that you cannot graduate with first class from Nigeria and get an employment directly? They can consider you as a student for your MSc or for your PhD. But with that terminal degree from Nigeria, particularly outside medicine and few other courses, there are countries that even your certificate will not be accepted. You have to know this. We have certificates, we studied in Nigeria, we studied outside Nigeria, we work in Nigeria, we work outside Nigeria, but definitely based on experience, exposure, and many more. Today, employers are looking for people that will immediately add more value to their team, not employees that are looking for more training while on the job. We have to appreciate this. Some people may argue otherwise. Don't be angry. Why? Because it is only the level of their exposure. Your level of exposure determines how you think. It opens more doors for you. This is very important. So when you talk of whether you need connection, connection is part of the skills. It's a soft skills. And when you say connection, sometimes you only think of government employment. It is not about only government today. The opportunities of employment out there globally, they are even more important, more relevant, more beneficial than local employment you are looking for in your country. Even if it is working with government in other countries, there are places, if, even if you are looking for the payment, will not be compared to what you have been taught here, for example. So don't be narrow-minded person. No, the opportunities are there. And particularly in northern part of this country, we, 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 we don't patronize in the global opportunities out there. We are narrow-minded people. We only think of our immediate environment. Sometimes somebody is not even thinking about his career. He is only interested in becoming a PAOSA. That is all what is enough for him. Why can't you think of how you can employ somebody to be your PA or your SA? You employ him to be your PA or your SA. In addition, through this concept of skill development, you will discover that many cities have been developed globally. And through mentorship, like this one being organized by Ariwa Youth Mentorship Program, it is the same approach that produced Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, the name was coined in 1972, when some silicon chips were used in developing semiconductors. From that name of silicon chips and semiconductors, Silicon Valley was coined. Today, Silicon Valley in America, because of mentorship there, you will discover that there is no way to success without mentorship. I say it and I repeat it. No way to success without mentorship. It is not possible. The coordinator of this program, Dr. Yakubu, mentioned our elder sister, professor of physics from Biyuki, as his mentor. And he also mentioned the speaker today as his mentor. At least in Nigerian context and anywhere in the world, Dr. Yakubu is successful in life. Still, he feels he needs mentorship. 
So by implication, your mentor should be someone's mentee. We mentor others, but still we have our mentors in our life. That in certain situations, we reach out to them for guidance and they provide the guidance we need. We need. Is true mentorship and promotion of this industry and academia relationship brought about Silicon Valley. Today, if Silicon Valley were to be a country, as at 2022, it could have the highest GDP per capita or GDP per head globally. Because Luxembourg in Europe in 2020 was number one in the world GDP per head with an 116,000 USD per head. Silicon Valley, if it were to be a country, even then it will have around 128,000 USD per head. By implication, $12,000 per head ahead of even Luxembourg, the country with the highest GDP per head in the world. Why? Because of making sure of this academia and industry relationship. You get skills, hard skills, soft skills, social skills, and there are mentors there every day to guide you. Mentorship. Check for instance, Bill Gates. Bill Gates was mentored by Warren Buffet. Warren Buffet is the most successful investor in modern history. Even recently, when there was a crash of some banks in the US, like the Silicon Bank, the US government reached out to Warren Buffet for guidance. The economy was in problem. So immediately they reached out to him how to turn things around. Look at even government of the US was being mentored by Warren Buffet. Mark Zuckerberg was mentored by Steve Jobs, among others. Steve Jobs, one of the co-founders of Apple. So you will not find a successful person without mentors. And we have to humble ourselves and be willing to learn. One of the most important lessons they teach in Silicon Valley, which I think is important, is they promote that failure is inevitable before you are successful. Two, don't consider failure as an opposite of success, but rather failure is the foundation of success. Because one setback should not discourage you. You have to keep on trying, trying, trying before you are successful. So each trial, you will discover you are building the foundation of your success. That is why they organize a conference annually where they mentor potential employers and entrepreneurs, people with their startups and students. They mentor them, fail fast, fail often. You will continue to fail, 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 fail until you are successful. That failure is not opposite to success, but it is the foundation of your success. And you have to consider it as such. Even the title of the conference is FailCon, meaning failure conference, to teach you how to accommodate failure. Jeffrey Bezos was mentored in Silicon Valley. If you look at the most successful investors, successful entrepreneurs among others, they were mentored in Silicon Valley. If you go to Shenzhen in India, uh, Shenzhen in China, Shenzhen is another example. You will discover that there is mentorship. Look at the way the economy of India is developing. And they don't have problem of unemployability. Some even without certificates, they will come and do a work that people with certificate in the area cannot do it. So try to delete the word impossible in your dictionary. Failure once, twice, three times or more should not discourage you. Keep on trying until you are successful. Jack Ma in China, he applied to Harvard University 10 times without being accepted. He kept on trying, trying, trying. Three years ago, he was the richest person in China. And if you look at successful leaders in the world today, they were mentored by others. Whether Muhammad Mahathir in Malaysia, 
whether the president of United Arab Emirates, whether the leadership in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whether president in the US, like Barack Obama will admit to his mentors. So mentorship is part of what we I agitate in the book. There is a section particularly on mentorship. And I also outlined clearly mentees and their mentors. And you'll discover the mentees are leading the world today. It is not about you, but people that are willing to allow you to climb their shoulder and see where you cannot see without being on their shoulder. This is indeed very important. So uh, to save our time, I, I am of the opinion, it is better to make it brief since the book is available online on Amazon and other e-commerce platform. If you go through, you'll discover more and more explanations about the issues I have uh, discussed here. Continue with your studies. Acquire your certificate, but ensure the certificates are not empty. Secondly, I'm telling you based on experience that today certificates alone are not enough. They are relevant. They could be relevant. They may be relevant, but they are not enough. When you acquire them, that should not be the end of your learning. Continue to learn, relearn, and unlearn. Learning should be throughout your life. Prioritize your skills development, particularly soft skills and also your social skills. When it comes to hard skills, there are many certifications. Ensure that you acquire them. Your certificate is obtained through the informal education you enrolled. But certifications give you more skills. They give you more skills. Both of them could be relevant. Your certificates on one hand and certifications on the other. I am working on a book on certifications that will guide you to your success on hard skills, soft skills, and social skills. In addition, I have another book that could be out of the press, most probably end of uh, this month or early next month, entitled A Scholar's Journey. Navigating Academia. I only documented my 20 years in the academia with hard skills, soft skills, and social skills. And if the book is uh, available, I believe you will know. And if you go through, you will discover certain things may be beneficial from what we have gone through in our life before we attain the position where we are today, either academically or policy makers or religiously among others. I only documented that not because it's not my biography but rather documented some lessons. The book has over 320 pages. It's a, it's a bit bulky but still very relevant particularly to our younger ones that are willing to learn from the little experience we have uh, acquired. And I believe that if you follow you will avoid some of our mistakes, you will save your time and energy, and you will be more successful than us because mentee is supposed to be more successful than his mentor. What your mentor learns in 40 years, he could teach you in 40 days. And this is indeed very important. To allow more time for participants to interact with them, I will appreciate the coordinator and the moderator to please allow them to come forward for that. So permit me to shut down my presentation from here without clearing the screen. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Wow. Um, uh, what a wonderful talk. Um, usually I do kind of summarize uh, what speakers have said. Uh, but you've also done that job for me, sir. I uh, guess because of that, you know, academia expertise, you've already, you know, spent quite some time detailed, provided a detailed 
uh, talk and then at the end of the day summarized everything uh, so we really appreciate it thank you very much for that maybe i'll just pick on a few things that you've mentioned yeah. um uh, pertaining to some of the skills uh, you did classify the skills as you did in your book into hard uh, as well as soft skills um and some of those uh, skills you've mentioned for example when you're looking at the um the hard skills you did mention that you know, that could be, you know, mathematical skills, for example, programming skills, AI, cloud computing. These are sort of skills um, uh, that we learn in our universities. But the problem is most of those tend to be a bit theoretical as well. So we have to um, uh, kind of get the practical aspect of those uh, skills as well. And then what you did mention is for students to really prioritize, uh, you know, getting those skills, not just focusing on the certificates. You did give an example where quite a number of students, if they're given the option to choose whether to, you know, be participating in the class, uh, get the skills, get the knowledge, and then be awarded the math that they get at the end of the semester, as well as another option where they don't have to attend, and all they have to do is just be awarded a pass, Quite a lot of students would uh, do that, which is really, really unfortunate. And really, I think we'll have to switch that mentality from, uh, you know, just wanting to get the certificate, just to graduate, uh, to really getting uh, the skills. Now, in terms of soft skills, you've mentioned um, uh, quite a number of uh, a number of soft skills. You did mention um, uh, things like. Uh, um, uh, like creativity, for example, you said creativity is all about um, uh, thinking out of the box, right? You don't just agree that there's a single way of solving a particular problem, but rather uh, think outside the box, find ways uh, for which you know that particular problem uh, could be solved. You talked about um, complex problem uh, solving, so a typical example you gave uh, you gave is uh, Amazon, which was um, uh, which came about due to this complex problem solving. And the example you also gave was, you know, it took quite some time for Jeff Bezos to start uh, making profit from uh, his company. But then because of that dedication um, and his ability to, um, uh, you know, hone this particular skill, he's now one of the richest um, uh, people in the world. You talked about um, critical thinking, which was actually the first soft skill that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. You said quite a number of uh, companies have came out of that, for example, Facebook, uh, Uber, and uh, a very important advice that you've given is for our graduate projects to focus on, you know, solving a number of the challenges that we're focusing or that we, you know, experiencing, rather than just, um, you know, getting some outdated research project. It should be problem centric. Try right? to provide. Um, solution to the problems that people are facing. And one of the um, examples you gave was um, how Gmail, uh, Gmail came about, with, or rather Google came off with the policy of the 20% time policy, where the employers get to have time to uh, critically think, and from that, the uh, Gmail um, was developed. You talked about coordinating with others, as well as collaborative thinking, um, uh, because as you've mentioned, a number of problems require you know more than one person to solve so you need to be able to collaborate with other people in order to solve uh, some of these um, uh, complex problems and uh, another important skill you mentioned is the project management skill quite a number of time we take this for granted um, we have all the experience as you mentioned things like building a house getting married but we don't really take those to be um, uh, project, we just focus on um, formal projects, but rather, you know, what we need to start doing is to be honing those skills that we utilize in, um, you know, those uh, project, project management practices uh, that we've uh, encountered. We've also talked about judgment and decision, um, uh, how, um, you know, we talked about a number of countries like Switzerland, uh, where they have a kind of a dual education system that looks at both the soft as well as the uh, hard skills. Another important thing that you've mentioned is social skills. Now, this aren't just, um, 
you can classify this in a way more uh, to the to the soft skills, if I if I may do that, if you allow me to do that. Um, you're looking at um, how you communicate or how you interact with other people. You know, very very minor things that you might take for granted. Um, you know, the need to be generous, to be kind, to be uh, to have that humility, uh, and as you've mentioned, small things like just smiling to someone or holding. Uh, the door to uh, someone that's behind you, you know, saying things like thank you and please. Um, these are very, very important skills um, which uh, I think most of us should really uh, focus on honing. Um, you did mention, um, uh, you did advise that we shouldn't be narrow-minded. Um, as also highlighted that employers nowadays are just looking for employees that would um, you know, just what they're really after is employees that will add value onto their organizations, not uh, to employees who would, you know, try to get those skills uh, over time, which is really costly for them. Uh, so I think, I'll, of course, finally, you did spend quite some time talking about mentorship, how important mentorship is. Uh, and again, we really appreciate you being here to um, uh, provide this mentorship session. Um, you talked about mentorship specifically in terms of uh, places like the Silicon Valley, where failure for them is inevitable. They, are, they have quite a number of quotes, uh, such as they fail fast, fail often. They've got the, fail, uh, the failure conferences where people really celebrate uh, failure. And I think this, again, is something that we'd have to, uh, you know, put at the back of our minds that just because you fail doesn't mean uh, that you can't make it. You just have to um, you know, you know, keep failing, and then over time, uh, you definitely make it. So thank you very much. I know I haven't done justice to what you've said. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. I'll call on uh, Dr. Akubo. I'm sure I've missed quite a number of things. We've got the um, uh, the organizing committee as well. Uh, I'm sure there might be a thing or two that they might also pick on. So Dr. Akubo, um, anything that I've missed on that you want to add on to that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tai. I think you have done well, really, in summarizing the wonderful speech by Prof. Uh, I just remember that uh, I was asking Prof if it's possible, uh, maybe he could use slides, PowerPoint slides, to make his presentation. But then he said maybe he might not need it. Now I really understand why he would not need PowerPoint slides. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, bro. So I think we can go to the next uh, phase of the presentation, of the session, so that we can allow people to interact. Uh, with you. Right, okay. So yeah, as uh, Prof did uh, mention, I think it's, yes, of course, it's very good to be interactive, to get you know all those questions, all those comments. Uh, so I think we'll start with the Q&A session right away. Um, you know, quite a number of people have read the book. Uh, we've had a discussion within uh, the organizing committee. And uh, I think, first of all, I'll call on uh, Dr. Fauzia uh, to ask her question. I know she has a question. Some of us have mentioned probably I would be a bit biased, starting with uh, some of the members of the organizing committee. Uh, Dr. Fauzia Yakub, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, sorry, Dr. Fauzia, uh, do, do you want to... Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I don't have a question. I just have uh, some things to share or some things to add um, okay. regarding what Prof says. Uh, Rob, Barca as well. Thank you for uh, coming. Bar uh, Bar Barca, before Dr. I start, <laughs> yeah, well, and before I start, maybe at the end, I, I would like you to cut up as well as you said on the matters now, correct? <laughs> so uh, I would like to share like some inspiring observation about student here, which I believe uh, we can adopt for your own success. Uh, what I notice here, many students have uh, kind of part-time jobs such as uh, waitressing, sales position, and so on. Uh, you know, like uh, bus arena, IT. So. Uh, this job not only provide them with valuable skills, uh, but also help them kind of cover some part of their tuition and other expenses. So I believe like uh, I'm just calling on a student, especially the ones that are uh, complaining yes, our tuition. So you can start uh, maybe going uh, working, you can go to like a store 
quarry and so on and just go there and start doing some part uh, part time job. Believe me, you will get some valuable skills there. So um, I I believe by the time you finish your degree, you you have all those kind of skills uh, that Prof is talking about. And remember, it's just for you to present it in your CV. Sugar coat it, for example. You can write during my first degree at BBK, I work at a sales a person at a store. In that role, I suggested implementing Excel to track sales and customer data, leading to improve sales and affordability. So you have like show that you have those experience because some jobs like uh, you will see they will say uh, they require after you finish your NYSC, they will say uh, they need like two years of experience, blah blah. And then you'll be wondering, you know, me that I just finished my degree, how how am I going to get those experience? Believe me, is uh, you can get uh, those experience as you are uh, doing your degree. And also another thing I would like to share is um, I started gaining computer skills uh, during my secondary education. And even at that time when my father was taking me to those uh, computer schools, I did not understand the impact. It's when I started uh, getting jobs, I now understand why he was taking me to those computer school. Believe me, all the jobs I, I got, I can assure you, most of them is because of my computer skill. So thank you, Prof, thank for you. Uh, 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 coming to give us this talk. And I hope uh, if, uh, we are all going to uh, benefit this and work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, I, could, I noticed Prof was uh, really nodding. Probably he might want to say a thing or two pertaining to what you've said. Uh, Prof, do you have any comment to make or do you want us to um, move on with uh, maybe get more questions first? Okay, you may wish to add one more, I think. All right, thank you. Um, uh, okay, Maja, is Maja here? Because Maja had, a, I think, a comment or a question to make as well. Can we unmute Maja, please? Nice question. Yeah, I think I'm already on mute. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Maju Haruna, and um, I just wanted to uh, actually don't have much question, but I wanted to take a moment to thank um, Prof for joining uh, us here and also for giving us a very wonderful presentation and for writing such an insightful uh, uh, book actually in this very uh, time. Um, I have read the book and um, it has really helped me as well. Um, despite that, I have gone through so many several certifications and uh, do from BSc to PhD and also make many other studies in a different institution. But um, currently, uh, where I work, because I'm from academia and industry, I'm reading Prof. book that um, helped me to make some um, huge adjustment to myself as well. And uh, I would like to thank Prof. for that. Um, also, from the book, actually, I have, um, I read through, actually, the future of the work yeah. that is currently, um, that we have seen a rapid change in the future of the work. So I wanted to um, ask Prof a question here, or want a Prof to make a remark, um, particularly to the government in Nigeria, um, or to um, the universities or state governments on how are they going to, or how are they planning to actually improve the situation to our uh, youth to, because we have already seen how, the, how uh, the future of work is changing rapidly in the workplace. What are, the, what are they planning at the moment in terms of um, meeting this world demand? Um, we do lack a lot, in, especially in the areas of innovation and uh, lack of creating some uh, vocational tech and technical training. Previously, I know there are so many things like that in Nigeria, but I think um, we do have less of it at the moment. Um, can Pro please advise um, our university and the government in terms of making more efforts to um, make more changes in the sector? And uh, another thing is maybe by creating more apprenticeship opportunities for our younger generations to, uh, because um, if we can have such opportunity, I believe um, there would be a lot of skills that uh, 
uh, be acquired by our um, future generation. I don't want to keep sorry talking. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, sorry uh, to maybe cut you off, I'll doctor. Like to stop here um, and uh, thank Prof for his own uh, time. And uh, thank everyone for, uh, for the organizing committee and also those people who join us here. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's it for me. All right. Thank you, Dr. Monty. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof, you've had uh, those two uh, comments and a question. Okay, so, so uh, I'll give you a uh, once again, briefly, I begin by commending Dr. Fawzia Yakase for reminding our youth about uh, certain opportunities available out there, uh, in which I spoke on that in the book also on freelancing, which is very important that uh, as a young person you can have multiple employers through freelancing which is dominating the world today. Many people or institutions are not looking for uh, permanent staff or permanent employees. They are looking for people that can do the work uh, for them in respect of their location. So through freelancing, you can work for 10 institutions. And location doesn't matter. You can be any part of the world, but you can work for them. Take, for instance, in Google, uh, more than 30% of their staff in 2020, uh, working for them through freelancing, not full-time jobs. So I think it's important. I am glad uh, uh, what she has uh, achieved, even as a student, and also her encouragement and uh, challenge to us to allow our daughters and our wives to study, which I think is very important. important. Allowing our daughters and uh, our wives to give them all the support they need to be successful in life is very important and i'm glad to say that i believe the reminder is important but most probably i'm on track at the moment i have three daughters in university three biological daughters in university so which is encouraging one of them is in final year studying medicine i have a daughter studying international relations i have a daughter studying information technology all of them are in university so i am proud to be one of the fathers and parents that uh, sponsor and support their daughters. My wife obtained her first degree in my house from first year to final year in my house, not outside. So uh, we got married at the age of, uh, she was around 16. At that time, six, 17 years, around 17. At the end of her secondary school, immediately I enrolled her into university and she obtained her degree starting with even NCA before degree. So this challenge is important. And I always encourage them to continue to further their education. And uh, furthermore, with regards to some uh, kind words and recommendations from Dr. Haruna Maji, and I believe they are also very relevant with regards to what he has mentioned in the book and also challenge to some of our students. I spoke on future of the work in the book, particularly on page eight to page nine, up to page 10 and 11, I, future of the work changes. And that is why in schools like IIT in India, curriculum is not static, it's flexible. It's flexible. And because of that, solid foundation is key. In the model of Indian Institute of Technology, most experienced academics teach most genius students. The most experienced professor in a faculty will teach 100, 100 level students because they need a very strong foundation at that level. But today, most of our concepts you will discover a graduate assistant or assistant lecturer or lecturer too is teaching 100 level students and the gap between them is not very wide. Sometimes the way he was treated before his graduation is the same way he will treat them. Instead of becoming their elder brother, he feels more of an opportunity for him to retaliate. I still teach in university. When I went to Federal University of Technology already teaching, I said I will not teach MSc students. I only teach 200 level students because in cybersecurity, 100 level is a general course. Since the time I started working with them, all the courses I taught so far, are for the lowest class where they offer cybersecurity courses, which is 200 level. MSc, I say no. 
because the mentorship I want to provide is more relevant to new students because at that level, I treat them as my children and they treat me as their father. That is the relationship. However, I supervise PhD students at least to continue to be up to date when it comes to research uh, among others. But when it comes to teaching, I am more interested in the most junior class because this is where they need mentorship and they need a very strong foundation to be successful in life. When it comes to the issue of government, there is no time for me to respond extensively and intensively on how government can provide the enabling environment. But I strongly agree with him that is very relevant. And that is why triple helix model is key. Academia, research and development, and sometimes even coming up with innovative ideas. Industry is all about the deployment, providing corporate social responsibilities, and also providing the hard skills that are required. While government providing the enabling environment for that relationship and constant interaction to be very successful by coming up with policies that are flexible and they are developmental, in addition to providing seed funding, grant, loan, among others. In that Nigeria start of 2020, within the digital economy sector, all these challenges have been addressed, including a provision of providing soft loan, seed funding, among others, with a minimum of 10 to 20 billion naira to be spent by government annually to support our young innovators. We have addressed that aspect in the digital economy sector. Outside the sector, I believe it is difficult for me to speak on behalf of them, but I strongly agree that government needs to do a lot. And that is why in the book, if you look at page 93 and page 94, I emphasize more on funding our institutions, particularly research and development research and development. And so government must provide sufficient funding for research and development. However, another challenge to the academics, we should partake in research and development for the sake of research and development, not for the sake of that money to be paid or to be given. Some, they only conduct research in two situations. One, when there is a research grant. If there is no money, no research. Secondly, when it is time for promotion. So he will try to acquire the minimum papers required for promotion. When he is promoted, that is the end of it. Many academics, when they become professors, with due apology to our sister, Professor Rabi Al-Sayed, I know she's not like that, since she produced somebody like Dr. Yahu. Many, when they become professors, that is the end of their research. He becomes a professor in 2014. It was the last paper he published. No any other research, no book written. It shouldn't be like this. When you reach the peak of your career, it is the actual time for you to give more back to the society. And it is the time that your mistakes are going to be minimized more and you become more authority in that area. So I believe there are challenges everywhere and we must try to push and address them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Right, okay. So I think I'll call on uh, Usman Ali Lohan. Usman Ali Lohan, I think you have a comment or a question to make. Uh, sorry, because of my network issues, I won't be putting on the video. Uh, I want to thank Prof uh, for his time and also for the detailed um, uh, explanation and uh, mentorship that we have received um, the last about two hours. Allah is Hakad al I mean, thank you. I am an advocate of uh, what I call certificate, which is actually what Prof has written and said uh, skills rather than uh, just degree. I, I feel like uh, the school system is being designed to produce uh, people who just go to school for the purpose of the certificate. And without skills, the certificate is only a beautiful piece of paper with our names calligraphed on it. This is the way I like to say it. Uh, having said that, um, uh, nobody is better placed to uh, start this advocacy than Prof himself. He is a Ravad Sheikh, he is a professor, and also he's been in policy, so he is a model and um, everybody will listen to him. And I am very happy that he's taken on this uh, mantle. Uh, again, Allah is Sakad al-Khairi. Uh, however, 
my, my position and, and, and the question, or rather the appeal I will do to Prof is this. I, I feel like um, as much as we advocate to young people, which is mostly what we are doing to take responsibility and you know, be able to take care of themselves in terms of seeking mentorship, in terms of seeking skills and doing what's right by them. I also think that the university system and the government especially needs to address a lot of things. In our schools, for instance, some of the curriculum are probably 20, 30 years old. I remember when I was in the university, some of the lecture notes are probably 15, 16 years old, handwritten. And uh, so how do we advocate for the lecturers because we need the paradigm shift, not only on the students. We need a paradigm shift from top bottom. How do we advocate for the lecturers to have this mindset shift to be able to tutor the students in that direction? You have a, a student who graduated from business administration who doesn't know how to write a business plan, has no idea about ideation, for instance. And then when we talk about the government, I also feel like there's a lot of policy on the ground there's a lot of programs, some projects that the government has put in place. But when it comes to implementation and execution, that's where the problem is. For instance, I don't want to start mentioning programs, but if you look at the CBN 100 for 100, for instance, uh, we applied since uh, three years ago. We haven't had any response from the CBN or uh, the bank that we applied to. In 2017, we, did, uh, we participated in the um, BOISP, and uh, it was 2017, we got approved but we didn't get disbursement until 2019. And then much later, they came back and said, you know what, you're doing very well. If you pay down this money, we'll be able to give you times three of what you got. Well, we paid down. And up till this moment, nobody has said anything to us. In fact, we are so tired of going there. So what do we do? We have now, you know, gone back to our funders like the USADF, USAID. That's what we leverage on. But how many people have the knowledge and understanding that you can actually get grants or funding from these multinational agencies and, uh, and organizations? A lot of people don't even know how to write grants. So how sorry do we advocate? I, sorry to cut you off, because I think there's quite a number of uh, people that want to ask questions. Um, uh, if you yeah. can just summarize that, just finish that point there. OK. Thank you very much. So how do we advocate for both the universities and the government so that these uh, opportunities will be democratized and the people who truly need it will be able to get access to it? Thank you, Prof. Thank, Thank you very much, oh. Doctor. And uh, once again, sorry for continuing short. <laughs> um, I think uh, next I'll call on, maybe we get one more question. Uh, Halima Abdurraouf, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please make your comment. Uh, if you could be brief, I think that would be really helpful. Is Halima here? If not, maybe uh, Umar Farouk. Umar Farouk. No? Okay. So maybe nope. we'll just... Yes. Salam alaikum. Alaykum salam. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. It is my pleasure. And uh, even though I was like uh, eight minutes ahead in Tokyo, attending a nuclear innovation boot camp, it's like around midnight here. Yeah, I decided to stay awake for this uh, wonderful discussion. I can't miss it. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, your participation yeah. from there. Yeah. I'm glad to know that uh, the book is in no way negating the needs for certificates as Prof discussed. Uh, even though I am yet to uh, read the book, but uh, my question is that, okay, uh, for youth that have the potential of becoming maybe the next Pantami in terms of uh, teaching, students Islamically and also participating in governance and policy making, uh, if Allah so wills, how can someone create a balance between day-to-day -day job and the Quran, which is our life? This is the question I have for Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we get one more, sir. Um, Dr. Shadi, is Dr. Shadi here? Dr. Shadi, 
Can you mute yourself and ask a question or make your comment, please? Is Dr. Shadi here? If not, let's look at. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum 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 alaikum. We can hear you, Dr. Shadi. Go ahead, please. It seems probably his network's not good. Um, about how are you good? How are you good? Can you ask your question, please? Right, it seems it but seems she's yes. not. Uh, yes, go good ahead, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. My my question, sir, is regarding the soft skills. Please, how where can we learn the soft skills, or are there ways that we can learn the soft skills? Is it online, or we have to attend school because I don't know where we can learn it? And secondly, sir, you said that there are schools like MIT and Harvard that have that usually do the certification that you can learn online. So sometimes, sometimes the processes of applying all these things, we don't know. You have to. I don't know if you can guide us on how to do all these things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've got uh, three com uh, three people that have made comments and asked questions. Maybe I'll give you the floor to respond to those now. So thank you very much uh, to all the participants who uh, commented and uh, commended our modest effort of uh, making the presentation, starting with our brother, either to say Dr. Usman or Dr. Farmer. I don't know which one to, to say, Dr. Farmer or Dr. Usman. Uh, I enjoy each and every word you uttered here. And I admire also your passion for both government and academia to discharge their responsibilities effectively. I strongly agree with you. There are many challenges government needs to address when it comes to being successful as a country for skills provision. And also there are challenges in which academia must address as well. For government largely has to do with funding. Funding I think is number one. Two, government also must ensure it prioritizes our institutions when it comes to research and development. Let us not always think for solution to be imported into Nigeria. We have to start by challenging our institutions to come up with solutions to our problems, particularly indigenous ones. So I strongly agree with you. Government has the responsibility of providing the enabling environment, including sufficient funding, and secondly, promoting research and development, and thirdly, prioritizing what our institutions in Nigeria have uh, produced. These are some of the issues that uh, uh, we always urge government to, to address. We, and we always do that uh, whenever there is opportunity. I recall that the former Minister of Education, whenever I meet with him, Adamu Adamu, there is no way I will not mention at least one challenge in education that uh, I advise him to ensure it is addressed. So there is no doubt about this. Uh, even if we feel as a government we don't have sufficient fund, but there is always room for improvement to challenge, to support our education, uh, our institutions to partake in R and D and provide solutions to our problems. When it comes to universities, also I agree with you that uh, you'll discover a lecturer, his lecture is for 10 years, 10 years without any improvement. It, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> if I publish a book today and uh, I want to reprint it tomorrow, I believe that definitely no matter how good it is, I will try to improve in certain areas. At least some additions and subtractions. You must try to do that. But it doesn't make sense 
for your lecture not of last year to be used this year. At least within that one year, it must be updated significantly, if not replaced completely. This is important. And I think the main reason, many of our colleagues are in academia, not because they are passionate. Many are there because of necessity is the only option available. When they get another option, they leave academia. It shouldn't be like this. I think one of the most noble professions in the world is teaching. If you look at it intellectually, religiously, and otherwise, one of the most noble professions is impacting knowledge to others, whether it is worldly knowledge, religious knowledge, or any form of knowledge that is beneficial to humanity. So we should try to be very passionate about what we do, and we should not take uh, academia as only the uh, available option. It is our priority. We join academia because we are interested, not because we couldn't have any other option. And we are still in academia, not because there is not any option. We have 1,001 1, options on our table, yet we prioritize academia. We know there is no profession, pro, a profession that is noble to us like teaching. So we should be passionate about what we do. And that is why in and outside office, I always teach, I always publish, and I always write. Why? Because I'm passionate about that. And we should always be passionate about the work we do. Sister Halima Abdurov, I think she couldn't comment, most probably because of network problem. Our brother Omar Farouk Ahmad also glad to hear you joining us from uh, Tokyo. And uh, I appreciate your kind words. In addition, the issue you raised with regards to certificates, whether the book is pandemic certificates, both the title of the book and the content, none of them condemns certificates. There is none. Even the title is skills rather than just. Just is synonymous to only. It's just like saying skills rather than only degrees. Professor Abubakar Rashid is a professor of English language from BUK. The immediate past executive secretary of National University Commission, during unveiling the book, he said, what he admires in the title is the word just. That just is very important there. Skills rather than just. And he's a professor of English language. The video is available out there even online. So he said even the word just is the most important word that he admires. And he even challenges our brother and friend, Professor Idris Muhammad Bugaji by saying, Bugaji is advocating skills, not degrees. But he said mine is in between. It's skills rather than just degrees, meaning skills rather than only degrees. He says, so this just is very apt. And he's a professor of English language. So, so the, the, even the title of the book is not in any way, but what the book is emphasizing. Firstly, your degree should not be empty. Secondly, the priority is not the certificate, but the training you are going through as a student. That is what is important. And three, certificate is not the target. Certificate is only to validate the skills you have obtained. It's just validation. Skill is validated. And if your certificate fails to validate any skill, then the aim of acquiring it has been defeated completely. There is no doubt about this. And finally, certificate is not the end. When you acquire it, there is more burden on you to continue to improve and update and validate your skills because the future of work has been changing. After every five years, you will discover that what is required today after the next five years could not be the same. New challenges emerge in the world and there is need for new skills to address the challenges. Dr. Shadi, Sokoto couldn't comment. I wanted him to speak, particularly no, about, no. about his, uh, his school, particularly Brilliant yes, Food Stamps yes, International sir. Academy, and also yes, that's it about, about my daughter, Fatima Yusuf, and Barira, I think. So I'm glad you are here. Fatima yes, no. wants to comment on Hawaii Yuguda. My sister, Hawaii Yuguda, thank you very much for the kind words. Where to learn skills? Firstly, by obtaining a copy of the book, you will be able to learn some of the skills. I only mention them here because of time constraint. But if you go through the book like complex problem solving, there is an algorithm, nine step algorithm to follow in order to solve complex problem solving. 
like critical thinking, there are five steps. They are outlined in the book. Creativity is also outlined in the book and even the stages to be followed to attend that, including indirectly speaking on cognitive skills, which like learning, reading, observation, among others. So, so all these things have been addressed. So starting with the book is uh, very important, in my opinion. And secondly, if you go online, you will discover that there are so many videos from top class universities in the world, like MIT, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, including IIT, where they have many instructors with presentation on this. You will try to learn from them, starting with the book. From there, you will continue to develop on the skills. I will appreciate if Dr. Chadi will be given Shadi a minute to yes. speak. Yes, okay, sir. Um, uh, yes, Dr. Shadi, can you uh, go ahead yes. and ask your question? Make your comment, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm really yeah. honored, Prof, um, for re emphasizing my speaking. I want to say that um, um, all the way from Sokoto, we have about um, 2,000 plus students who have been reignited, you know, from the book skills rather than just um, degrees. And most of us talked um, about the challenges from the tertiary level. Um, we as educators, you know, down the lane of nursery and primary, secondary, over the years, you know, we've been faced with the challenge of, you know, what we aspire and are inspired to do in terms of the real future challenges of our kids, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, you know, um, the Nigerian educational system at the lower level, the aspirations are mainly for kids to sit for work and pass. Now we have realized, you know, there are more, there's more to that in terms of what we want for these kids. For instance, first of all, as Muslims, we want these kids to have a very deep entrenched knowledge about Islam that they could practice for this life and the hereafter. We want them to be embedded with skills and alhamdulillah with our exposure to the book. You know, initially we had a kind of myopic understanding of skills where we looked at from just the hard perspective. Yeah. But going through the book, you know, as a guide, we've been exposed to the soft angle, looking at social skills yeah. and all of that. And alhamdulillah, so far so good. However, Prof, sir, I don't know how what you could recommend it's a daunting task trying to marry all these areas together you know trying to teach them islam prepare them for why expose them to these skills we have to create extra time you know for these kids and institutionally you know government um, actually has not planned out a curriculum at the lower level that allows us to exploit all these ends how do you think um, we could institutionalize um, um, these things in a way that government would actually recognize the need for us, like you said, to think out of the box, out, out of the box, and, you know, integrate some of these things that we aspire for our kids into the educational system. Um, lastly, Professor, we are really hoping on the 13th of <coughs> August you'll be... Right. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry to cut you off there. Um, I think what probably we'll do is uh, give Halima an option as well. Uh, Halima, um, uh, yes, Halima Abdra, who was okay. in here earlier as well. Uh, can you ask your question? You. If you could be uh, very brief, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Inshallah. Um, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to the organizers and to our prof. Um, we are so grateful that you gave us this opportunity to interact you. with you. Uh, my question is on the whole thing around why um, Nigerian or Nigerians, young people, are not able to nail jobs like the one that was advertised with the Angote refinery opening uh, recently, which caused a big uproar. People saying, why should and the jobs uh, be given to people outside. But the problem was that um, there were no skilled Nigerians at the time, even in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, to take on that um, the role of 10,000 um, skilled workers. And there was a group that recommended that there should be a skill apprenticeship um, framework for every country. Um, Prof. Sir, in what ways do you think um, the Nigerian government can tap into this, considering the fact that recently um, you launched a center for something similar in Nigeria? In what ways can we incorporate this um, national skill apprenticeship 
um, center or framework for Nigerians so that it will be easy for us to get skills. And thank you. We are really grateful that you should um, champion this course of mentorship just like you. you did today by giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Prof. and the organizer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have quite a lot of people wanting to ask questions, uh, but given a bit of time constraints, I know it's uh, past for its own, you know, as we time already in, uh, in Nigeria. I think we'll uh, we'll stop here. Probably I'll just give Prof the chance to respond to these two um, uh, speakers and then we'll call it a day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parik, once again. With regards to the issues raised by Mala Mahalim Abdurrahouf, I'm in the opinion they are very relevant indeed, very relevant indeed. Particularly the example she earlier cited with regards to Dambuate recruitment. Uh, I intentionally decided not to speak on. But that case of Dangote has validated practically what we had been agitating and the paradigm shift. The, the, the report indicated clearly is because of lack of skill. Nigeria was losing more than 11,000 new jobs because of lack of skill. And for that matter, he went to India and I cited an example with Indian Institute of Technology. They don't have the challenge of skills. That is what they prioritize. And you'll discover that Angwete is going to recruit them, not because of the certificates, but because of the skills. They could have certificates, but it's not the priority. What they can bring on table immediately. But our challenge today, when you employ some of our children in Nigeria, you have to start the training entirely. It's just like somebody with first class or second class offer from a good university, you have to train him the way you would train, or very similar to the way you train somebody with Waiyek or Neko certificate. It shouldn't be like this. And it is not his fault. It's number one, lack of mentorship. Number two, the nature of the curriculum. Number three, the way, the mindset of our institutions. The mindset. And because of that, the mindset of the students is about the degree. No more knowledge. Just to acquire the degree and go. Many of them are willing to leave the university without going through any training as long as you give them the certificate. And because of that mentality, when you speak on skills, they will say, it's just connection. Somebody will give you the work. How can somebody give you the work in Angwati while you cannot do it? And even the connection that is beneficial is part of the skills. They look at the mentality. They don't even know that the exposure and the connection you could require from time to time is part of the soft skills to know some people that when there is an issue they can intervene. But, they, but you have to ask them to intervene legitimately and legally where you can add value. So I strongly agree with her and uh, there is need for us to have similar approach. And the, what she recommended of the framework is what I mentioned in the book with an example of Silicon Valley Shenzhen, and also institutions with MIT and IIT. They are good examples. When it comes to countries, there is a framework of Switzerland and Finland, and even that of South Korea. In Africa here, there is another model. That is in Morocco. In Morocco, they have a good model of skills provision. That is why you will discover our graduates are endangering their lives, trying to cross Mediterranean Sea illegally to Europe illegally with their degree and MSc's, while the graduates of Morocco, some even through centers only, have been received in U Europe with red carpets. They are respected. And some European countries are even coming to Morocco to employ them, not because of the quality of their, their universities, but the skills they acquire. And some of us, because of being narrow-minded, when you speak about skills, they only recall vocational training. Maybe you are thinking of mechanics or metal work or woodwork or electricity. <laughs> this is also hard skills. It's not what we are talking about. If you are talking of vocational training, it's relevant, but it's not more than 10% of what we are agitating and we are advocating. Umar Farouk Ahmad Aliya asked a question with regards to how to guide our younger ones to success by citing an example with my humble self. Because of time constraint, when that book, A Scholar's Journey, Navigating Academia, is ready by end of this month or early next month, inshallah, I advise 
our younger ones to get a copy immediately and go through it. I address many issues on career management success, particularly with experience of my life, what I have gone through, not only what I read. I cited examples, so many, and I believe they are very relevant. Dr. Shadi, thank you for the invitation on 13 of August 2023. Your invitation is being considered, and I pray to the Almighty to give me the ability to be there physically, if that's not possible, then virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this brings us uh, to the end of the session. Um, maybe I'll call on uh, Dr. Akubu, our coordinator, once again to <coughs> say a few words uh, of thanks, both of thanks uh, to uh, Professor Isa uh, and Brian. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Sarek, I think much has been said. Uh, the only thing I will say, Prof can vividly see or feel the mood of uh, the participants mm -hmm. that they need more of him. <laughs> they need more of his presence, actually. <laughs> so we hope in the future, inshallah, yeah. we will have similar sessions either on this one or on his scholar's journey that is about to come, or many other topics, inshallah. We really, really appreciate you, uh, you Pro, for giving us this uh, privilege. I will, I will, inshallah, try to make myself available from time to time. Particularly, as you said, when that book, I have another book in the pipeline. I am using the free time I have now to rest to work on them. I have uh, this a scholar's journey navigating academia. I also have digital agriculture. I wrote a book on how to support our farmers in the developing countries to engage in digital agriculture. And I also working on the, uh, another book on counter terrorism through cyber security and emerging technologies. All these three books are in the pipeline, and I do hope they will be available very soon. So from time to time, I will make myself available to join you and have more conversations with our friends, brothers, our children, our elders, among others. Alhamdulillah. So we have gotten an excellent takeaway, Dr. Tari. I think this is enough for us as a takeaway. Thank you. <laughs> yes. um, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much once again, Prof. Uh, we really appreciate it. We are honored. We've really learned a lot. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think we look forward to seeing more of you. Um, you. Uh, again, I think uh, the final takeaway is for each and every person to make sure they get that copy uh, of the book, read through, uh, and of course, get the benefit out of it. So thank you. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, of course, uh, to you, the participants, you've been an amazing audience. That's, we do apologize for the um, limitation in time of time. I see over 50 people wanted to ask questions. However, um, due to that time limitation, we're not able to give you the opportunity. However, remember, we can continue discussions uh, on our social media platforms. Uh, I think what we'll do, Dr. Yakubu, is to get some more questions and probably for those to prof, and then we can see how we can um, you know, get back to the uh, participants. So thank you very much. Um, have a good day. You can also be part of it as mentor or student. Join the Ariwa Youth Mentorship Program on Telegram, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. AYMP, together we can be great.